G'day mates, and welcome to the backlog, and welcome to Broken Roads. I'm your host, Jason Wright, and I'm a voice actor, but uh, the Aussie accent is not my best. My British accent keeps taking over, and that's not the right, that's not the right vibe for this game at all. This is supposed to be, if Fallout was in a, a post-apocalyptic Australia. What would that look like? And what would it feel like? And the developers for this game are calling this the very first triple I game. It's an indie game from an indie dev, but they've put the love and the effort and the money into making it as good as they can, like a triple A game. It's an RPG. It's got a weird morality system that I'm excited about trying. So let's dive in and I'll show you what Broken Lo Roads looks like as we play through this new RPG. They thought ending the world would end the war. That much was passed down. Everything else has been lost. When the bombs dropped, 80% of Australia's population was wiped out, just like that. Those who weren't immediately vaporised carried the radiation inland, poisoning all the pretty places they crawled to. The desert swallowed the rest. Despite it all, we survived. We rebuilt. We even formed strong enough allegiances to have wars of our own. But these wars were of disease, of hunger, of people who'd forgotten the sacrifices that have always been made beyond the steady glows of the cities that now choked with dust. Our great-grandparents made it. We will too. All it takes to thrive in this new world is guts, grit and hard yakka. That's where you come in. All right. So this is... This is this is a little bit interesting. You get to pick between these four different origins and then you adjust your appearance and you get your, your starting morality and then you'd get your statistics. So as an as an RPG, it's just it's just a really interesting spin that they're taking on it. And I think I want to go as a jackaroo. Yeah. That's right. It's got strength and biology and tinker and resolve and I love that they're <laughs> that they have a stat called punt. <laughs> so good. All right, let's go. We're a jackaroo. I think we're going to go with this one. This is this is Logos. Logos. Yes. Now this is the, this is the moral compass. There's utilitarian, Machiavellian, nihilist, and humanist. And as you make choices, it will rotate this little pie around, giving you access to these traits or perks or abilities uh you can also if you, the choice you make is like you know kind of between these two it'll actually expand this pie upward but if it's definitely humanist it's like a core humanist belief then then this will get smaller but you'll gain access to things that are down here even close it's just a really cool idea we'll see how it works though hmm Hmm. All right, we got six questions. You and your crew are hacking through the bush when you hear screams off to your right. An unwary bloke stepped on some mating death adders, and he and the Sheila who pulled him back have both been bitten. They're in for an excruciating death unless you can help them. The problem is you've only got one dose of anti-venom. Do we give them both half a dose? It's possible they'll it'll be insufficient, but it's better than simply letting them die. Save it for yourself. If it's breeding season, so there. If it is breeding season, there'll be more snakes around. Three, give one of them the anti venom and put a tourniquet on the other's leg and leave it to get help right away. Okay, or give it to the bloke. Because <laughs> he's the senior of the two. Okay. Um, I think I like this idea. Give them half a dose. I don't know. If they're, if they're young baby snakes, though, they're just going to. Mmm, that probably wouldn't save them, though. I don't have time to think about that. Give them both half a dose. Okay, that was distinctly humanist. All right. After a series of wraiths on caravans passing near your home, you put together a scouting party. You've caught a bandit leader and one of his raiders. The leader pleads for release, pledging to comply with your terms. Do you free him? Execute them both on the spot. Better not to have that kind of headache. 
Take him back to town to stand trial. This is not your call to make. Escort them far away, warning that if you catch them here again, they're dead. Tell him that you'll let one of them go free, him or his raider. Then he gets to choose which one lives. Um, I'm going to go with this one. We are living in civilization, so a trial is necessary if possible. A nearby townstead has a new chief, and he's starting to flex his muscles. He sends an envoy with a threat, pay tribute or suffer his wrath. He clearly has the military strength to back it up. Do you pay? If he thinks he can take it, let him come. You're not scared of his threats. Negotiate with the envoy and escort him back. Concealed, your top fighters follow. In town, publicly execute the envoy, displaying his head on a spike. Warn the others to surrender their chief or face the same fate. Send scouts to see if he can enforce his demands. If he can, pay up. If he can't, send him a mocking reply and dare him to come take it. Send an envoy in return and try to negotiate with the new chief. War hurts everyone. And maybe you can work out a way to be of mutual benefit. Yeah, oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Start with negotiations. See if you can, uh, you know, I mean, you may have to resort to something more visceral, but uh, at least try. A child in the village has started showing symptoms of the plague. Oh, no, it's COVID. The town chose to quarantine him and his family, but you caught him sneaking out of the house to play with other kids. Now what? Let him go with a warning? If he's contagious, you're all infected now, too. If he's not, no harm done. Rally some neighbors and evict the entire family from the town. Make an example of their carelessness. Send him back to his house under careful guard. The whole family will have to leave town if they continue to put everyone at risk. Return him to his house and explain to the family what will happen to the town if they are all infected. Make them see reason. Huh. I like these bottom two. Yeah, let's do this one. Good, good. You've, camp you've been captured by people who have clearly gone mad. Finding yourself in a pen along with a dew farmer you've met before. A mercenary, stripped of his weapons, and a terrified young family. The captors assemble a massive pyre, indicating their intent for a twisted sacrifice. Noticing a guard's distraction, you're certain you can escape on your own. But every person you bring with you increases the chance you'll get caught. Take advantage of the distraction. So try to get everyone out, saving as many as you can. Slip away on your own. The others will simply have to fend for themselves. Convince the Merc to come with you. The Dew Farmer can likely find his own way out, but the family will be nothing but a liability. Get the family out first. The other captives should be able to handle themselves. Huh. No, I think we have a better chance of getting out if we all work together. Or at least the most of us getting out. I, You know, I could be wrong, and I don't, but yeah, let's go with it. Question. You have discovered a cache of pre-apocalypse supplies in an abandoned farmhouse. You can't carry it all back on your own, so you enlist a few friends from town to help. When you return to the cache, you find a group of emaciated scavengers in the process of looting the place for themselves. No way. Threaten the scavengers. And if they don't hand over the supplies, kill them. Let them take the supplies, but secretly follow them back to their home. Once there, you can loot their goods and kill them all. Let them go. They're starving and clearly need the supplies more than you do. Plus, they had no way of knowing you found them first. Tell them you found the place first and offer to split the takings. Better to get less than you wanted than to spill blood or get nothing at all. Ooh, I like those, bo those bottom two. Well, let's go with number three. Okay, cool. Cool, so we are we are kind of between utilitarian humanists right here. <laughs> and I, I, love, I love all of these ideas of, oh, hey, let's... Let's put a chart around morality, like like it's that simple, like it's that easy. I'm loving the idea of seeing where that goes. Okay. Hmm, what do we got going on here? Oh, because we've got five intelligence and charisma, we get ten base stat, eleven base stat, eleven base stat, but we got extra biology and tinker because of our class. There, I like that. Pretty even. Pretty even. Now we've got 30 to spend over here. Okay, let's get that up. Because then once we get to 25, we get an extra an extra little bonus. He runs his hands down his arms and legs as you approach, sloughing off waves of red dust. Welcome to Taylor's Farm. Continue. Ah, yes. Okay, so this is the tutorial. Let me get through the tutorial. I'll see you on the other side. After we get the inciting incident.
John's let you off for the night, has he? He sizes you up. I want to hear more about this showdown with the older side, but I'll do my best thinking after a beer or two. Pub's right there. Unless you've got a few more chores you need to wrap up first. Nah, let's go grab a beer. You'll get no argument from me. Excuse me, I just need a moment of your time. The speaker is a tall, broad-shouldered man, well-groomed with a gold necklace and gold bracelet glinting in the sun. Despite his size, he moves with a fluid grace. He reminds you of nothing so much as a big cat. Attractive, smiling, and dangerous. Who are you? We're kind of busy here. Can your business wait? Spit it out, then. All the humor is gone from him, like the... Like he senses a threat. He's alert and focused, his eyes never leaving the newcomer. His voice is low and calm. My name is James Wakefield. I'm glad to have met you, Mr. Jones, as I come bearing a proposition for you and your people. A proposition, he repeats flatly and dismissively. Better make it quick, mate. He holds his hands out, palms up. Let me be plain, then. I come from a powerful community to the east... We're rebuilding civilization, and we'd like to invite Brookton to be part of that effort. Join us, and we can end the age of grubbing through the relics of the past. Join us, and we can usher in an age of miracles. His eyes narrow. You want us to bow and scrape to someone who's never even looked our way before? Who never had the good grace to come and say hello himself? He spits to the side. Civilization. <laughs> and what do we get out of it? Pray tell, civilization will bring the rains, fill these fields with wheat again. What happens if we say no? It actually might, you know, irrigate your fields. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Okay, so we either remain silent or we chip in. Up to petty analogies, are we? He shakes his head without so much as looking at you. The adults are talking, kid. I, I, I don't like Mick. He stares at the stranger silently for a few seconds. We've got nothing but your word to go on by, mate. Show us some of these miracles, if you're so keen to bring us into the fold. He chuckles. Mr. Jones, I was sent merely to make the offer. I'm a messenger, not a diplomat. If it's petty, pretty words you're after, you're not the man I thought you were. Well... Mr. Not-A-Diplomat, why don't you go back home and tell your overlords that if they want us kissing their boots, they're going to have to prove those boots are worth the tongue. Till they can, answers a hard no. He takes the answer with equanimity. I must ask one more time. We can offer your people many things. Food, water, protection, freedom from want or care. The future in its limitless possibilities rather than scratching at a living on the edge of darkness. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe we like the darkness. The, I'm sure there'll be lots of communities after an apocalypse that are all about that darkness. Hmm. Yes, yes, this is the question to ask. What's the cost of protection? Because freedom often is not free. Hmm. We wouldn't be the first to succeed either. You know, I'm beginning to see who's uh, the jerk here. <laughs> they have, they have, um, <laughs> they have notes. <laughs> okay. No means no. Uh, you seem to know a lot about us. Who are you and where did you come from? You see, this, this seems like uh, the, the good question. He spreads his hands. I'm simply the bearer of good news. From lands to the east. Nothing more, nothing... Yes, which lands? His voice has descended into a low growl. Mate, you're about to get boot polish where the sun don't shine if you don't take a hint and rack off. Get lost, also see you get stuffed. <laughs> no need to be rude. His tone is mild. You've made your choice clear. My duty was to ask... And so I have done. Be assured that I shall sleep soundly tonight. A good evening to you all. He stares after Wakefield, thoughtful. Tomorrow we can send someone to follow his tracks and find out where he came from. We'll get to the bottom of this. Oh, I'm going to need a beer or five after that ordeal. 
Or see you's in the pub. All right, all right, let's go talk, let's go chat, let's get this game started. Suddenly you're fixed with my mixed piercing gaze. Let's get down to brass tacks. We had a bit of a yarn after you came back from Avon River, but I've got more to say about your conduct, if you're of the mind to hear it. <laughs> only if I get to reciprocate. Uh, I start trying to make sure I'm the only person. Sure, why not? Let's be, yeah. Well then, he gives you a measuring look. Here we go. I'll decide it'll be crowning about how Brookton's gone soft. Now you made the right decision not to shoot anyone, but our reputation's taken a bit of a flow because of it. Then it'll need to be set right. Try not to blunder your way into a further incidents with our allies, would you? It's hard enough to keep them sweet as it is, without handing Sarah over to become the community doctor. Now, <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. Again, he fixes you with an intense stare. Uh, I don't think you actually want me to do that. He roars with laughter. You're right, I don't. I'd have to hand me in my mayor's badge. He wipes his eyes with his fingers. I like you, kid. Maybe there's more to you than I gave you credit for. Maybe there is. The sound of hail reaches your ears a moment before Sean bursts into the pub, screams and cloying smoke trailing in his wake. Uh-oh, Sean, what's going on? Get out here, we're under attack! The growl of his voice carries in the shocked silence. Mongrels, let's show them what it means to tangle with Brookton. She grabs her rifle from the wall and cocks it. Let's rock! All right, first big battle. Let's do this. Oh. Oh, this place was a lot better just a second ago. Hold on. Where's where's my map? Where's my map? Okay. No, no, come on. Oh, I can't go that way. All right. Stop going down this one. Hey. Hey, buddy, um, I didn't get the key. Come on, man. His eyes are wide, white orbs in the darkness. Get me out of here, man, come on. Mick's got the key. Mick, Mick, where you at, Mick? You hear the tone of gunfire shift. If he doesn't stop yelling, you'll be targets very soon. I'll ask Mick for the key, wait here. Okay, um, are y'all getting ready to leave? Good. Another pair of hands. Her tone is brusque, projected easily over the rattle of gunfire. Sean needs help loading medical supplies into the ambulance. How are the tires coming, John? He gives her a thumbs up and keeps doing whatever it is doing underneath the vehicle. She pauses momentarily in her stacking and sorting. And there's that bloke from uh, Cokeby, the one with ra radiation poisoning. Well, we're full up. I'll have to stay behind. Good call. It isn't good or bad, it's just what it is. She scans the lines of boxes, filling the ambulance and shoves another one into an overflowing shelf. It fits perfectly. Um... Mmm, he says, okay. Shh. Try to save him. Try to save him, leave him behind. <laughs> you want me to take care of him? Oh, that sounds Machiavellian for sure. Um, this sounds utilitarian. Okay, um, yeah, let's go see if he's got, if he can help us. Ask him then. She goes back to shuffling boxes without another word. Are you the guy with the radiation poisoning? He's sitting up, his face pale and oval in the darkness. Thought I was feeling better, but now I'm not so sure. Am I hallucinating? Mate, this is really important. Do you know where to get medicine? Anywhere at all. We have to go and can't take you with us. I'm sorry. Um, help him out to the ambulance? No. I have to pull your weight. Help him out to the ambulance. Okay. Um, he looks up at you, expression guarded. I might know a thing or two about that, yeah. That knowledge is going to save a lot of people. Come on, I'll get you to the ambulance. Can you show me on my map? Great, that'll buy you a spot. Let's get you in the ambulance. 
He simply nods and raises his arms like to you to you like a child. You help him up as he shuffles towards the ambulance. Party gained 300 experience points. Oh, good. Hey, he knows where to go. Okay, find out what's going on. Tell City needs to stay behind. Collect a med kit for Sarah. Leave Brookton. All right. Oh, and we've leveled up, actually. We've got one of these to spend and 13 of these to spend. Fantastic. Let's get another awareness. Perception and insight. Range damage, accuracy, critical hit chance, dodge, and helps avoid ambushes. Yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Let's do that. All right. What else is going on? What's going on up here? Hey, where, there were kids down here. Where'd they go? Oh, they're all right. And the... the oh, Abigail. Abigail, hey. Where did all the crops go? They burned very quickly. Bob and Dawn are straining at their harnesses, almost overturning the cart. Mick is shooting at, shouting at Jess over the rattle of gunfire. We're not leaving until we've made a few more people clear. They spot you at the same time. Let's go! Jess's voice cuts through a sudden silence. I said not yet. Mick grabs Bob's harness, stopping Jess from leaving. He glares at her. Where are the others? Uh, go see if anybody needs help. I need the key to Dead Ringer's cage. Are you kidding me? He pulls a small key from the ring at his hip and throws it at you. Hurry up! Okay. Um, I'll go see if anybody needs help. She groans in frustration. Hurry! All right. Uh, rescue five townsfolk. Is is this one of the five townsfolks? Olive. Oh, there's one. Okay, we just gotta get close enough to him. Two. Ah, yeah, Isabella. Go, 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 go. Three. All right. We said we'd let him out. We gotta be, gotta be men of our word. Come on, get me out of here. Come on, men. <laughs> Use the key. Here you go. Hold up the key, then throw it into the bushes. Oh no, no. He barely waits for you to unhook the padlock before he shoves the door open, knocking you aside. Catch your light, as soft heart. Yeah, you could say that. Wait, what's this? <gasps> Whoa! A pistol, bandages, some money? Uh, yeah, I'll take all of that. Thank you. Jonesy! Jonesy! Oh, I can't, I can't go up this direction. It won't let me at all. Okay. Collect a med kit for Sarah. Oh, there it is. Found it. Oh, here we go. Jake runs out of the darkness, dragging Alana behind him. Bullets pinging off the road in his tracks as he shoves Alana toward you. Wrenching his hand free of her grasp, she lands against you hard, throwing you off balance. Take her and go! I'll find you! He's already running back toward the gunfire, dodging and weaving, one shadow among many in the flickering dark. Jake! Alana pushes you away and runs after him, unarmed. She's defenseless. Let her go. There's no helping someone who doesn't want to be saved. Chase after letting her distract Jake. We'll only get him killed. She'll only slow you down. Oh, no. Um, yeah, yeah. She's, she's defenseless. You catch up with Alana quickly and grab her arm. Let go of me! Her screams draw gunfire to your position, and you feel a searing line of pain as a bullet grazes your leg. Come with me now. Pick her up. Knock her out to save her life. Knock her out to shut her up. <laughs> oh, no. These are the same thing, but with different heart motivations. Okay. Come with me now. Yes, come. She struggles against her grip, but can't break free. Jake, I'm over here! Oh, I gotta pick her up. 
You try to get her over your shoulder, but she struggles and kicks you so hard you drop her. You only just managed to grab her arm again before she runs away. Okay, we gotta knock her out to save her life. You wrap the butt of your gun against her temple and she collapses into your arms. You drag her to the clinic. Sarah does a double take when she sees you carrying Alana. What did you do? She looks Alana over and gestures irritably at the ambulance. Put her in. What about me? Sid looks inside the ambulance, fidgeting. It looks awful cramped in there. Sarah turns to you. Look, I know what I said, but Alana's my friend. Plus someone knocked her unconscious. Can't exactly leave her to fend for herself. No one speaks for a moment. The awkward silence is broken by gunfire and Sid clears his throat. I reckon you leave me a gun, I'll make it out all right. Does anyone have a gun they can spare? Take out, uh, take out some of the medical supplies? We can all fit? No, um, that one. Here, Sarah hands a pistol she had tucked in her belt. It's not much, but it could do some damage if you know how to use it. Ta! He takes the pistol, holding it loosely in one hand. Sean makes a nest for Alana in amongst the jumbled boxes and gently places her inside. You, Sarah, and John get into the ambulance and you watch out the rear windows as the flames of Brookton fade to a dull glow across the horizon. Without warning, the raiders were just there, cutting people down as they ran, eviscerating anyone who didn't and burning everything else. Brookton was a growing community, making the most of a shitty situation after the world went and fucked itself. Brookton was, with no hope now. People scattered and ran, some were found, some were found too late. Many weren't found at all. Morning comes, cold, with a hint of fire on the horizon as you cross the vast red desert. The pale faces of the survivors who reached Bally Bally Hall were ovals of white in the darkness when you left, watching as you, Mick, Ella and Mad begin your trek towards the answers none of you were sure you wanted to find. Smoke no longer rises from Brookton. The visiting winds have carried it away in the night. You listen for the cries of the wounded, but hear only silence. Even the dawn chorus of kookaburras chattering in the trees is absent, chased away by the smell of blood and gunpowder. Mick leads you through the gate, then stops. That's when the nightmare becomes real. Spread out and look for survivors. Scouts will hold up around the pub last time I saw. All right. He points towards the clinic. You said you and Sarah left by the south gate. Might still be some plies to, to collect. So, he turns to you and feel the full intensity of his gaze. You've proven yourself capable in a pinch. Where do you want to start? Uh, we should go to the market, look for scouts. I'll check any of the townsfolk made their way to the clinic. Good oh. He nods in your direction. Allah, mad. It's on you to keep this young fella safe. We'll meet up at the cricket pitch. Be thorough, but quick. All right, you got it. Oh, the party gained a level. Oh, now there's three of us that I'm controlling. I gotcha. Can I, can I just pick one person? Nope, I'm controlling all three of us. Okay. Oh no, we missed one. I, I didn't, the game didn't give me the chance to find that third person. Oh, lots of stuff on them. Might as well just take everything. A pencil, some sunscreen. Immediately, you can tell that the clinic has been picked clean and empty bottles have been smashed. The ground, a multicolored kaleidoscope of wanton destruction. He sprawled on the floor, Sarah's pistol still clutched in his cold, lifeless hand. From the blood splatters on the doorway, you gather he took his attackers by surprise, even if it wasn't enough to save him. Yep, take the pistol. I know it's a bit utilitarian, but we're taking the pistol. 
It takes some work to pry his fingers loose. Eventually, you unhook his death grip, and his hand falls heavily to the floor. Sarah will want that back. Her tone is mild, but the implication is clear. You want to look around a bit? Are we done here? Let's take a few minutes to search. At the back of a shelf, deep in shadow, your questing fingers discover a parcel wrapped in wax paper. Pulling it out, you unwrap some long shards of bark. She looks at it and shrugs. Whatever it is, Sarah will know what to do with it, right, Elle? Ella doesn't reply. She's standing with her finger on the trigger of her rifle, staring out into the sunlight. Jake would have left us on if he was safe. Something's wrong. Her quiet words carry easily in the dead air. The sharp crack of a gunshot reverberates in the silence. Before you could have even had time to fully process the scene, Ella and Matt are both sprinting towards the marketplace, weapons drawn. Sprinting, sprinting, sprinting. What do we got going on? Oh, over here. Jonesy, Mick, Dreamer. He's against the pub wall, with Jonesy's head leaning on his shoulder. He looks up as you approach, then gently disentangles himself from his dead son and stands... Let's get the rest of this mess sorted then, eh? He walks off towards the cricket pitch without another word. Yep, it was quite a hard yakka. Her footsteps falter as she approaches Mishti's corpse. Her face remains an impressive mask, impassive mask, as she examines the bullet wounds at throat, neck, and thigh. Two spots of color rise in her pale cheeks as she consciously moves her finger from the trigger of her gun to the guard. Mad steps forward, her jaw set in determination. Elle. Don't! The word rings out in the silence like a slap to the face. Mad doesn't wince, but withdraws. She walks away without another word. Oh, I do like that they can move the characters around and give it that um, that narrative feeling. Neither of the sisters slow their steps as they approach their cousin's lifeless body. Mad shifts her weight, and for a moment it seems like she might give him a kick for good measure. But she restrains her impulse after a glance at Ella. Well, this she, sucks. She chews on the inside of her cheek, staring through Jake's lifeless face. It really sucks. They stand in silent agreement for a moment, neither of them willing to break the silence. Then Ella sighs and turns away. Let's keep moving. Hey, Mick. They didn't survive. Hey, mate. She... This has been quite the fucking shit show. I think Mick's about ready to pack it in. She begins, her voice cracking. She takes a breath, composes herself, and continues. You ready to be done with this place? Yeah, I'm done. We should look around a bit more first. Yeah, I'm done. Well, she glances it's at been Mick. a tough day, but we're not done yet. It's clear by now that help isn't coming, and without some sort of protection, our days here are numbered. She pauses again. The way again. I see it, we bury our dead and we head off to Meriden. The radio's still out of Bally Bally, so we'll have to swing by and pick up that lot. We'll need to travel by night, but even a crawl by the light of the stars will be better than lighting a bonfire back at the hall that anyone can track us by. Any objections? Hmm. We may not have time to bury anyone. Seems well fortified. Why can't we just stay there? I think they're blowing this bit out of proportion. Huh. We may not have time to bury anyone. He's right. His voice is raw, like he's been sucking on gravel. We should move on as fast as we can. We don't want to get caught <laughs> with our pants down. Yeah. I appreciate all you've done for Brookton, Mickey. But you're not the right state of mind to judge that. She nods at Mad. These people deserve what little dignity we can return to them. Normally I'd say we have to let the dingoes take care of it, but yeah. She scratches her armpit. I'd want Jake to bury me, I suppose. I don't mind digging. Oh, do I only have the one option? 
<laughs> you know what? Forget I said anything. I don't know these people. Why should I sweat for them? Yeah, okay. Let's go this one. Right, that's that then. You, she points at Ella. Get to work carrying bodies over here so we can stick them in the dirt. You, she points at you. Help her. And you, she points at Mick. Go have a sit down. <laughs> Why does he get to do it? Yeah, do what she says. Uh, yeah. It's never easy to say goodbye before you're ready. Her voice is raw. Especially when you thought you'd have more time. Like this, she spent the last few hours swallowing glass. She stares at the mounds of dirt, unseeing. She shifts slightly, watching the horizon, hands on her gun. I've still got a lot to learn. Jake was the best of us. Jonesy kept us light and mished. Words fail her. I didn't know her, but no, no. Let's let's remain silent. She would have known exactly what to say. She wipes her eyes with the back of her hand and gives a shaky sigh. We have to get moving. His voice is as hollow as his gaze. Pity party's over. He walks away without a backwards glance. Subdued, Ella and Mad follow behind. You take off into the wilderness, walking by night, until you've put a couple of days' distance between you and the flames. No one talks, or if they do, it's all in whispers. You have enough food, just enough, for now. Suddenly, a crack, like the sky breaking in two. You look up at the cloudless vault, but Mix caught the tail end of it through his binoculars. Pick up the pace, is all he says. People are more than tired. They're exhausted, but mixed words light a fire under them, get everyone moving as if the devil himself is hot on their heels. Then again, looking at the rising plume of dust and smoke ahead of you, maybe it's not the inferno you left behind that you need to worry about. He shakes his head. I don't believe it. It's got to be a hundred years since anything this big flew. And he's got the chops to make jet fuel these days. I'm getting really tired of surprises. He talks out of the side of his mouth so the others can't see. I'd ask someone of your obviously defective judgment for advice. But any thoughts on what Sean and John are talking in walking into here? I've never seen anything like this. I don't know enough yet to have an opinion. Hmm. Oh, Jackaroo, whoever did this wasn't working alone. Yeah. You think anyone survived that? But he gives a little nod. If they did, let's hope they're not in the mood to put up much of a fight. Go on, then. Come get me if you find anything. Will do. All right, so it's the three of us, and he's just kind of around. This is interesting. It. I'm I'm kind of liking the the flavor and the feel of... This party RPG, but with other people that you're not in control of, kind of part of your party. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. They just haven't flown since before. How did it get... How did this get here? Too bloody right. What a beaut, eh? I've had a little poke around, but still can't quite make heads or tails of it. The voice gets louder as, it, as its owner makes his way towards the group. I'm sorry. Who are you exactly? Name's Dajar... Jar... Jarly. Jarly. Dajarly. I don't know. But everyone calls me DJ. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> you must be Sean, eh? You all just told me heaps about you, including uh, that you don't get out too much, right? He looks behind Sean to the convoy and waves. Hooroo, Jess! Bob, John doing well? She's in the middle of talking to Sarah, but takes a moment to return the wave. So I guess we're here for the same reason. See a big plume of smoke rising in the sky? You take a gander at what's burning. Gander? A look? See also a squiz? Ha! <laughs> Fun. Okay, I like these little pop-ups. Those are nice. It gives a good-natured shrug. The door's completely jammed shut, but the wing's torn off. I didn't want to head inside alone, but now that you're here... We've got safety in numbers, yeah? Let's have a crack at it. No, we're good. What do you think, Sean? 
If Jess says he's good people, then he's good people. Beauty! Wouldn't mind the company. Rode a camel myself all the way here. And it wasn't the best conversationalist. Yeah, and Sean a walkie-talkie. Speaking of speaking, found this guy on the ground, but I can't make him squawk. Welcome, DJ. He has it in his hand. Feels like the batteries are missing. He pops the compartment and peeks inside. Yeah, we're SOL. Might be able to scrounge some up. I'll ask around. He clips the walkie-talkie onto his belt and looks at his father. Come on, Dad. We should see if Mum needs help treating the people with heart st- head heat stroke. Bird income. He looks at the smoking hulk again, then back at his son. Yeah, all right. I guess you'll tell us what you find at least. Fair dinkum. Real or true? Yep. Too right, mate. Wistfully, John follows his son back to the ambulance. Come on, let's get inside. Hold on. The lid of this container's been forced open. Whatever's inside is long gone. Wind whistles through the shattered glass, lifting what looks like the sleeve of a shirt. Oh my, okay. There's no visible handle in your fingers. Find no purchase around the edges. Doesn't look like anything could pry them open. All right, let's just uh, work our way around then. More pried open boxes, yeah. Do we see any? Oh, there's a, there's a row. Oh, here we go. Whoa. Look. He points towards the break in the fuselage. Two bodies lie motionless on the ground. Yeah, let's check him out. But it doesn't look good. It does not. Too late for both of them. She's had her throat cut. He's been beaten to death. And, mate, this happened very recently. Hmm. I'd like to check the bodies out myself. I do have a pretty good, um... Pretty good biology skill. You inspect both of the uh, passengers, victims? Hard to tell. Either way, you conclude DJ was dead on with his verdict on how dead they were. DJ still cradles the head of one of the bodies on the ground in his hands. Mate, I'd love to say different, but dead is... The man's eyes fly open as he gasps. He looks towards his companion. Jensen! Then he sees you and recoils in horror. Shoo! Shoo! He drops the heads, the man's head back in shock. The victim's eyes close once more and his limbs go slack. Oh, all the bloody bats had a bloody hell. Okay, he is 100% certified dead this time. Are you sure? Maybe it's worth going through his pockets. You should check his vitals for just one last time. I promise I won't ask you again. He glowers at you, and it seems like he's going to refuse. Then he takes a breath and puts his fingers to the man's neck. Still dead. Okay. He takes a deep breath. Bit disrespectful. I'll check exactly one place, but that's it. What shall it be? His shirt, his pants, his shoes? Um... Okay, okay, both of these I don't have. So this is probably utilitarian, and this is probably Machiavellian. His shirt, his shoes, his pants. Obviously his pants. He raised an eyebrow, but searches one pocket, then the other. Nothing. Oh, some string, but that's all. I stand on ceremony. He's dead. Check all his pockets. <laughs> What's more with feeling? Not him. He's probably still dead, but you should check just in case. Okay, fine. Mate, show some respect, all right? These people deserve better than to be picked over like people. No, we need to know who they are. We have no idea who they are. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, this, this. They still deserve respect. Funny how that works, isn't it? She stretches. I'm looking forward to becoming a saint when I die. Should be good. I stand on ceremony. He's dead. Let's check all of his pockets. He steps between you and the bodies. No means no. Yeah, not this time. It doesn't. She pushes past him and briskly gives the corpse a once over. Finding nothing, she shrugs and goes for the dead man's boots. Why, it's not once, not. As she pulls them off, a small key slides out into the dust. Hey, jackpot. He looks away in disgust. Must have been important. May as well find out what was so worth protecting. Indeed. I don't... No. Yep, 
You peer through the torn fuselage. Wrecked seats fade into dimness, but you can make out the open door to the cockpit, cockpit and a clear passage through. You could easily hoist yourself up and enter the down plane from here. Oh yeah, yeah, let's get in. Okay, so this is kind of cool how it how it goes into these like cutscene sort of thing. So you're not on the tactical grid, you're just here doing choices and learning things. You climb up and walk past empty seats. The acrid stench of the engine smoke hangs thick inside the fuselage as you make your way towards the cockpit. Inside are two bodies still wrapped, strapped into their chairs. The blood pooled below them, still dripping from fingertips, reveals how fresh this scene is, but the pilots are still lifeless and cold. Boxes and small containers lie strewn in the aisle, aside from the pilots up front. The other seats are empty. Search the boxes, and the, let's do the cockpit first. Look over there, says Ella, pointing out the cockpit window. That hut to the southeast. You peer through them and see a small, disheveled building, likely an old, abandoned cattle station. Worth a closer look, she adds. From here, you can see a small, open lockbox on the ground outside. You take a closer look at the pilots. No breathing, no pulse, only the slowly dripping blood not yet dried. DJ st steps closer and kneels next to each in turn, checking their heads, necks, and arms. Cold, he says, probably from the moment this thing came down. He glances outside involuntarily. Not murdered like those two outside. This place has been ransacked. Ella's voice rings loud in the silence. Whoever did it might still be nearby. We need to search the area. Either way, they have more clues or they'll have seen what happened. Search the boxes. Other than some more serious denting around the corners, the locks have clearly been pried open. Someone's been in here as well. You turn back past the rows of seats and climb out the torn fuselage. Okay, okay, what about here? If there ever was anything, it's gone now, yeah. Okay, let me open the map real quick. All right, Mick. We've got a lead. It's off to the, no was it north? North, I think they said? Yeah, I think it was north. I'll let you out of my sight for one minute and you come back with a new best friend. He glares at you. Who's this bludger? And why is he trailing you like a lost puppy? Lazy person. DJ, good to see you. She raises a hand in greeting before turning to Mick. He's one. He's the one who helped me apply the uh, suppository to Bob back when he ate that hessian sack full of copper wiring. <laughs> oh no, he grunts. I suppose if anything nets you a temporary spot with our crew is having to have your hand stuck up. <laughs> he fixes you with his gaze. This is temporary, right? Just to merit, uh, Meriden. Yep. You're being a bit harsh. I'm not to touch your... <laughs> He's not shy to touch dead bodies. Could be an asset. Pretty temporary. Yeah, it doesn't exactly obey the chain of command. Okay. We should let him make his own case, I reckon. Nah, all good. Reckon we'll be going our separate ways once we reach the big smoke, as it is. Uh-huh. He turns to you. Anyway, we've got bigger fish to fry. What do you uncover about the plane? We searched inside the plane. There were two bed dead bodies. I'm going to keep looking around. Two dead pilots. Some ransacked boxes and containers. The thing's been thoroughly picked over. A shame, but to be expected. Did they look like they were in that thing when it came down? Didn't look like they were from around here, at least. Strange looking clothes, and the hands were too clean. One of them had a key in his boot. She looks at Mad, who nods ever so slightly. Haven't found the lock it fits yet, though. Okay, we'll get a wriggle on. Can't spend all day trying to find out what happened. All right, let me see. Go this way? No one's lived here for quite some time. Shelter's no use when your nearest water source is kilometers away. That's true. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Oh, we're just going to take all of this stuff. Hope you don't mind. Oh, you got an emu. Oh, no, not an emu. Um, uh, I forget what it's called. Hey, you. Hello. This pudgy, frightened man wears ill-fitting stained clothes. He's been living hard, apparently. He spreads his hands to show there's nothing in them. 
To his credit, his voice hardly trembles. Good I, mate. Name's Omar. Reuben Omar. I'm a survivor by trade, surveyor by trade, and, uh, scavenger by circumstance. <clears throat> uh, please don't kill me. I'm totally unharmed. What happened here? Are you supposed, uh, are you responsible for this mess then? Why are you skulking around? Yeah, what happened here? I was exploring nearby when I heard this sound. Saw this huge thing plummet and figured, hey, salvage. Why not check it out? He's talking fast now. Almost panicked. Maybe get some good loot. I could sell, you know, maybe. Maybe get some uh, some taco. T turns out it wasn't the only one to have that idea, though. I snuck away when the mongrels arrived. Wait, the mongrels were here? He nods. I was sussing out the front of that thing when they drove up. They grabbed those two poor people from inside the plane, took them, and... Uh, his eyes cut towards the wreckage. He swallows. I'll just hid. I had to look inside the plane, but the dust is settled. Is there anything else you saw before we got here? Okay. How do you get away? Bodies are passengers in the plane. Good, good. Inside the... Yep, yep, yep. You're on your own. Come on, you join us. Call to make, mate. Yeah, I, it's true. Of course. Let's see what Mick reckons. Uh, of course we can. I'm with you, mate. Let's see what Mick reckons. He gives you a quick smile, not even acknowledging Matt. Really? Well, huh, bugger me. I didn't know what to say. Thank you, thank you. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. No decisions have been made just yet. <laughs> uh, don't let me regret sticking my neck out for you. Oh, you won't, I swear. He points at the plane, giddy with relief. Oh, this thing, eh? Glad it brought you my way. Well, let's go get this over with. I know you're going to love that. Oh, look. Someone else to share our dwindling supplies. He glares at you. You just can't go anywhere without picking up strays, can you? He turns his attention to Reuben. What about you, old mate? You look like you've been through the ringer. Though, of course, that's no concern of ours. Oh, I'm doing just fine, thanks for asking. He shifts his satchel subtly behind him. Just looking for a guarantee I'll make it back to Meredith safely. And what makes you think you'll find it with us? He speaks, speaks flatly, his mouth a thin line. He's a scavy. I said I found treasure amongst the trash. Surveyor, mate. He glances at Mick, embarrassed. On hard times, is all. I haven't made a career of scabbing, I promise. Continue. Sure you haven't. What else you got? Maybe this is a bad idea. Say nothing. He glances at you nervously and licks his lips. I can give you guild intros, access to the great traders, pathway to new settlements, you name it. He stares at him until Reuben begins to sweat. Then Mick shrugs. All right, I'll buy it. But if you screw us over, I'll report you for fraud. You'll definitely have an in with the guild then. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Mick gives, Mick gives him a look of baffled disgust. I'm going to keep looking around. Okay, we'll get a wriggle on. Can't spend all day trying to find out what happened. Oh, tire tracks. Hello. Okay, so I guess we weren't the first ones here. <laughs> Take a closer look at the tracks. Yes. You examine the tracks. There's some amber soil in the treads, unlike the ochre dust of the surrounding area. You suspect the soil must have fallen off the tires of whatever vehicle made the tracks. What's interesting is there's only one town in a nearby radius that has this earthy type of soil. Meriden. Ruben, um... Ruben was wrong, or at least not entirely correct. Even if one group did come from Ardath, there was another group here as well. From Meriden. The exact town you were headed towards before you stopped to inspect the wreckage. Hmm. Well, what can you tell me? We found fresh tire tracks near the plane. Not surprising that we weren't the only ones to have the come for a squeeze. Could you tell me anything about who was here? Looks like at least two vehicles. We're thinking the first set made by the mongrels and the other most likely from Meriden. And wherever they came from, they headed back there quickly. Meriden, eh? Guess that they that a lot have got to do something to justify the amount of guns and ammo they extort from the rest of us. Don't think they'll be too pleased to know they were here, though. He gives you a wolfish grin. That's all we found so far. All right, let's see then. He counts the points on his fingers. He goes, 
We know Meridin was here, but that's all. Doesn't give us a lot to go on and buy any negotiations. He gives you a stern look. Have you really had to check around? I can't spend all day here, but I expect to find more than this. Uh, it's pretty thorough. I don't think there's anything else to find. It's pretty thorough. <laughs> and, and this one's a lie? If you say so. He looks over at the crash, his eyes roving the scene. All right. Everyone ready? Our truck's ready to go. She looks over to her sister, who nods. Okay, now, as far as our new friend... He turns to face Reuben. Come up front with me. I've got a lot of questions for you. Right you are, mate. Let's move out. Travel to Meriden. Oh, my. Oh, DJ left. She's been at the gates for a few minutes now. It's impossible to hear what they're saying from this distance, but finally her calm composure cracks and she yells at her impassive opponent. I'm not leaving my people out there to bake in the sun. He says something. Gestures at the gates, then heads inside the town with a short, guilty glance at the convoy. The woman is arguing with, wears a white jacket with nary a stain or crease. She shields her golden eyes from the sun and pitches her voice to carry to you and anyone else who may have heard Jess's outburst. As I said, Meriden has had an influx of people seeking aid. You of all people should know how much it costs to house a population, let alone feed them. She spots you and Mick approaching, and raises a hand to forestall Jess. Miss Brown, your friends appear to have missed the line over there for... Uh, uh, for t'other siders. I suggest you all get back in that line before I ask my guards to put you there. We have information, we'll trade it for entry. We're not other siders, we're your neighbors. Please, we've traveled so far, we're so tired. Um... Yeah, yeah uh, they were your neighbors. Everyone from outside Meriden is t'other side. That's the only way we can ensure we're treating everyone fairly. Governor Smith, this is all that's left of Bookton. Our town was raided, and its inhabitants scattered three nights ago. Jess tells me you're harsh, but fair. As mayor of Bookton, I officially request your aid in retaking and rebuilding our community, starting today. Hmm. The man at the head of the queue pipes up. Who cares? Estonia's under threat from forces with ten times as much firepower as us. And I've sat in this line for two days and the off chance Governor Smith would deign to speak to me. Wait your turn like everyone else. She regards him coolly. Deign to speak with you, is it? Far be it from me to rupture such self-serving delusions by actually having a conversation with you. Governor, he re recaptures her attention. We haven't come empty-handed. We've got specialists in our convoy. Farmers, medics, a mechanic. You know Mad and Ella, scouts from Bally Bally Hall and old mate here. He gives you a critical look. He gestures to you. Go on, introduce yourself. I've got a knack for taking care of animals... Manage your crops better than most. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, This one. His peculiar voice cuts through the irritable muttering of the crowd. Have chased off some raiders. We're looking for our stolen sheep without being asked twice, too. A checkeroo? This could work. All you need to know is we didn't come empty-handed like Mick said. She briefly scans the rest of your convoy, her expression unreadable. I must say, Mick... You do have quite the group here. I can see why Jess was so adamant I let you in. She taps a finger on her chin. I'd love to help you, but there are plenty of others in this line with similar skills. What it comes down to is whether or not you can support yourselves without relying on handouts. If you could guarantee that you won't be a burden on our already stain strained economy, we can let you in. On a provisional basis, of course. Her lips compressed into a thin line. She turns and calls to the convoy. Anyone who grabbed more than the bare essentials, bring in here. The governor... Governor wants proof we can pay our own way. <laughs> if your crops are suffering, I can lend a hand. I got plenty of tricks up my sleeve. Here's proof we'll be able to keep ourselves afloat. Are you asking for cash? I can sell my kit if that'll help. Um, Do I have to give her the money? Uh, this one. She clears her throat to get Angela's attention and jerks her head at the thronging crowd outside the walls. 
She looks at the never-ending line of people and back at you. I'm satisfied with what you've shown me today, Mick. Meridin is open to your people. You and I will speak of your request for aid later, understood? He snaps out of his reverie. Of course, thank you. He heads inside without another word, and the rest of you trail in his wake. He walks towards you slowly. His head droops, and his once immaculately pressed jacket is now disheveled. He exhales, then looks up at you. He gestures to the makeshift camp. As much as I'd like to take credit for all this, I feel I dropped the ball. You and Jess did good work out there. Thanks for offering to be a dog's body for the governor. Free labors like catnip for leaders. I never turned it down myself. <laughs> he chuckles. He sighs and looks around. Here's the deal. I'm going to try to talk Governor Smith into helping us retake Brookton. You're welcome to get the lay of the land first, but if you could meet me at Smith House sooner rather than later, I'd appreciate the backup. All right, I'm going to have a look around then. I'll see if I can catch the governor before she gets bogged down in affairs of state. She's got a lot going on right now, but Brookton is a priority. It has to be. He says this last part almost to himself, though the conviction in his voice doesn't make it through the worry on his face. Farming is Meriden's bread and butter. So a crop connoisseur like you should fit right in. <laughs> All right. Oh. Oh, there's a lot to explore. Oh, my. Well, this has been a very long tutorial. I feel like I feel like this has been largely the tutorial. Um, and, and, you know, opening, uh, inciting incident sort of a thing. We've got... We just got another level up. We're level four now. These levels are coming pretty quickly. I think I think it's less uh, less designed to be a XP system and more of a more of a, a proper um, milestone kind of a feel, if you will. Um, and, and this, this looks pretty good. It's looking pretty good. We got a lot of stuff to sell and some money going on and a whole big map. What are we? What, what what's our point here? Meet Mick outside the governor's. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I'm hoping it opens up and we get a little bit more freedom going on next time. We're going to come back here in the backlog. Thank you all for joining me. We'll play some more later.